We just passed our framing, our mechanical, our plumbing, and our electrical inspections. We use NOAA. I like that they inspect every unit and not just the builder, like some other certifications like RVIA or West, I don't know, any, some other ones. I just, they just inspect the process, the builder, and then they don't necessarily inspect every unit. I like the fact that NOAA inspects every unit um, they're, they're good folks. Uh, they, I like the fact that someone double checks my work. We always pass with flying colors, but it's nice to have someone just double checking, uh, cause we're responsible. We feel incredibly responsible for these homes that we put out into the world that people make their lives in and, or build a business on. If it's a rental, like this one is going to be used uh primarily as a rental and vacation uh home so we just feel very responsible for it and i like the fact that it's inspected and it's double checked and uh, just it just helps so at this stage it's kind of the last chance to see some of the things before uh it all gets covered up and starts looking uh pretty but there's there's only you know this is the last chance to see some things that make a big difference in the performance and the comfort and uh, the durability of these homes so another behind the build all about weather sealing mechanicals and uh rough framing and uh insulation strategy before we get there there's some things that i want to talk about that uh, I see overlooked on some pretty major builders out there. And I want to talk about what we do different and how we solve those problems. All right, we'll start inside this time. We are ready to go inside and out for insulation on the inside is the next step. Uh, and siding is the next step outside. We just passed our inspections, as I said, and now I'll point out just a few things uh, that is interesting about this build in particular. There's quite a bit going on with the electrical budget, if you will. We've got a dedicated uh, circuit just in case uh, there wants, they want to put an incendiary toilet in there, and there's a dedicated circuit to the laundry. There's going to be uh, heated floors, which doesn't use a ton of amperage, but it is 240. Uh, we've got a 240 uh, mini split. Uh, we've got a electric water heater, and uh, we have put all of this in a tiny house in the past, and it performs admirably, uh, just fine on a 50 amp RV plug, but uh, there may come a time where they wanna add uh, more appliances or something like that. And this um, client was a little nervous about the electrical budget. So we went ahead and we added a conduit to this build. I'll just plug it with uh, some, uh, some neoprene putty and zip taped on the bottom. But uh, cause 50 amps, 240, that's the limit for our, uh, an actual like removable RV plug. Uh, if you want to go beyond 50 amps, which this client may in the future, you've got to hardwire. So we uh, we have this option to just add a conduit so that the wires can go straight up in there and they can upgrade the whole panel. Nothing really uh, has to happen besides uh, swapping out the main breaker. Uh, separate the grounds to neutral. This, this is beyond the scope of this particular video to get into uh, tiny house wiring, maybe in a different one. <laughs> Uh, really important uh, to seal the windows. We do one round here before the finish jam goes on. And once the finish jam go in place, then we fill between the finish jam and the rough jams uh, with more uh, just to seal that up and uh, eliminate any potential drafts. Now here's, uh, here's something that we do because you know, Noah requires it, but I think it's just a really good practice is we put the entire supply plumbing system under pressure and make sure that it maintains that pressure uh, so that there's no surprise leaks inside since we've got, you know, some plumbing in the walls. And uh, it's just a good, really uh, good practice. I'm, I'm glad that Noah makes us do it. 
and I just feel really good uh, knowing that it's all been tested. No surprises after all the, you know, the wood and the drywall and everything like that is on. Another uh, test is we flood the, this one has a shower in place already. So we flood the shower pan with water and that fills up the under chassis plumbing and allows us to check just to make sure there are no leaks. And uh, surprise, surprise, this hasn't happened uh, before, but I guess it's the first time for everything, but there's a, there's a nut here that if it tightens down a rubber uh, seal around the two inch drain pipe. Use this kind of drain connection, uh, it's very, very common. And I guess I just didn't quite crank it enough because there was a tiny little drip under this one and I had to just put, there's like a plate that goes in there and turn it just like a quarter of a turn, boom, gone, solved. It's just, you know, like it's easy to do at this, that, that would have been easy to solve no matter what, but it's, it's, there's certain things that are easy to do before you close everything up and you might as well test and make sure. It's good practice. All right, uh, the, what I really wanted to talk about is insulation strategy, and particularly insulation in the roof. So we are going to use bat insulation, rock wool bats are gonna go in between these two by six rafters. And if you do that, if you use bats of insulation, then the code says, uh, and building science says that you have to have uh, because that's a, it's a, a vapor permeable insulation. Um, and so uh, moisture and water vapor can make its way through the roof. It doesn't matter if you put a vapor, you know, retarder on here. It's like, it can still get like, you're going to nail into it and stuff like that. You have to have then a ventilated roof. You have to have a way for air to move along the underside of that uh, sheathing to carry away any of that moist that warm, moist air, especially in the wintertime, if the sheathing is cold, it will form condensation and it will cause rot and mold. If you have just regular, especially fiberglass bat insulation, but same, you know, the same is true with any sort of bat or vapor permeable uh, insulation. One strategy to, to not have to have a ventilated roof, which I think in a two by six roof, there's just not really adequate room to do a ventilated roof. So I want to avoid it at all costs. In the past, we've done spray foam. If you spray foam uh, right to the underside of the sheathing, then you do not have to ventilate because it keeps that sheathing uh, warm and it keeps any condensation from forming uh, under there. But that requires using spray foam and having a crew out here. They're, you know, it's kind of a noisy process and a little bit stinky because, uh, and so we actually are kind of grateful to be uh, cutting spray foam out, uh, you know, for the most part. It's still, I mean, a great solution um, uh, for, for getting rid of uh, having to ventilate a roof. And we've used it and it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a good solution. The other solution is to put insulation on top of the roof deck, which I'm going to have to go around the trailer to show you. So in this case, we're doing bats of rock wool insulation and we don't want to have a ventilated roof. So the solution is to cover the top of the sheathing on the exterior with continuous insulation. Now this is one inch of very rigid uh, very high PSI poly ISO. Uh, it's about R6.5 and, and it will keep the sheathing warm and keep uh, condensation from forming on the underside of that uh, sheathing and, a, and it allows us to avoid a vented, ventilated roof. This actually I think is the most, because it covers even, if you think about that, two by sixes are a little bit of a weak spot. You can't, you know, the spray foam's always going in between the two by sixes um, and those, so that can be a thermal bridge a little bit. This is the most reliable way. And so I feel really good about this solution. Um, and, uh, but I have seen many, many tiny homes go out into the world. In fact, there's one kind of big builder uh, that shows their work on YouTube and uh, they just use fiberglass bats of insulation in the walls and then the ceiling and they just obviously 
uh, have no plans, no uh, strategy for ventilating that roof. There's no gaps, there's no vents in the side. Um, and so they just have bats of styrofoam insulation. Uh, they have, you know, probably vapor barrier, uh, the craft paper on the, and think that's going to somehow do it, but it will not. And it, these, there's tiny homes going out into the world um, that would never pass a regular home inspection uh, and it would never pass a NOAA inspection. Um, but I, and it just breaks my heart that these these homes are going out into the world and people are investing like large sums of money into these homes. And it's not going to fail. You're not going to see it in the first year <laughs> before the warranty's up. Uh, but in a couple of years, maybe, you know, like give or take, th there's going to be moisture forming eventually on the underside of that roof deck and it's gonna cause mold and it's going to cause uh, rot and it's go it's tragic, uh, it's unhealthy and uh, certainly gonna cause building failure. And so I just say that, I put it out there uh, to just keep an eye on. If you're interested in a tiny home and uh, you're not going to, I mean, we can't supply tiny homes to everyone. <laughs> so if you're going with a different builder, just make sure, this is a question to ask and verify what is their strategy, what do they use, especially insulation in the roof, if they use bats of insulation, how do they ventilate the roof, and, or uh, do they put insulation on the top, or again, you could use spray foam. So hopefully this helps, hopefully this uh, helps people to avoid uh, buying something that's not going to last. Uh, I hope this, I hope this helps you out. We'll see you on the next one.